Thank you all for coming. Welcome. Um, I think this is a rather important subject and an important occasion, and we have two very qualified speakers to speak about the relationship between Russia and NATO, a relationship which, when I first came across it in the early 90s, was going to be a relationship of cooperation and friendship and every, all the strife was over and it didn't work out like that. And now we're in a period of considerable and some, in my view, very foolish rhetoric on both sides. I don't think either side is uh, behaving quite as sensibly as it might. Um, and just a point which I'm sorry to preempt what I'm sure you're both going to say, People talk about a new Cold War. This is not a new Cold War. The Cold War was a very serious nuclear confrontation where responsible people in government were very careful what they said. And they're not now, partly because it is not a, that kind of nuclear confrontation. Um, anyway, I'll introduce the speakers. And what we're going to do is the speakers will speak in turns, Ambassador Glushka first and Sir Malcolm second, um, for a quarter of an hour each. And then we'll have questions and answers. And if everybody, please, will, who gets up, asks a question, will say who they are. And if they want to say what their association is, fine. Somebody will bring a microphone around. Um, the talks are on the record. And they're going to be filmed and recorded. That's why all that equipment's there at the back. Uh, but the question and answers are off the record. Chatham House rules. OK? Now... Ambassador Glushko uh, is a long-standing Russian diplomat. He was educated at the Moscow State School of International Relations, which is a, an elite organization. And since he left there, since um, uh, 1997, yeah, uh, he has been in the Russian, well, I suppose originally the Soviet, the Soviet, of Foreign course. Ministry. Um, so he has a very long experience, mostly, almost entirely in the security field, either in Moscow or in Vienna with the OEC, OSCE, dealing with uh, conventional force reductions, um, with, I think, MBFR to start with, mutual and balanced force reductions. Uh, no, Vienna document, Open Sky Treaties, and a couple of other. Okay. And then um, back in Moscow as a deputy minister, as the director of head of the head of the security department there, then as a de uh, deputy minister, and since uh, 2012 he's been ambassador to NATO. Um, and Sir Malcolm Rifkind, of course, is a very distinguished and very experienced politician has been Minister of Foreign Affairs and Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Secretary of State for Defence, um, and also has a very uh, considerable experience of these issues, including the NATO-Russian issue, and has a lot of experience of Russia as well. If you'd like to start, Ambassador. Okay. And, uh... From here. Please. Yes, please. Well, first of all, I would like to thank very much the Russi for this possibility to speak in the oldest think tank institution of the United Kingdom. Well, uh, my topic will be about NATO-Russia relations and European security. And uh, may I start uh, by saying that uh, the history of NATO-Russia relations and even in the better times, uh, always was a source of uh, criticism in my country. Uh, many people uh, really did believe that NATO as uh, a security instrument inherited from the Cold War time for, and, and invented for deterring the Soviet Union and later Russia uh, could not be engaged as a security partner of the Russian Federation. There were those who are trying to endow the NATO-Russia Council with uh, some magic power and capacity to solve any security issue. Over the years, both sides got frustrated. Uh, 
NATO is still there in search for its niche and raison d'etre in international and regional security. NRC did not turn out to be an all-weather capacity, all-weather institution that could and should operate in times of peace and crises. Now we see that the body got almost paralyzed as a result of NATO's decisions to freeze all practical cooperation with Russia. Of course, the quality of relations between Russia and NATO in many ways defines the quality of European security, our common security. Both Russia and NATO remain key political factors in Europe. And the lack of all, their, all, of all weather dialogue uh, between them is, of course, not normal and even destructive. Many in Europe and in the United States tend to blame Russia for the current crisis, accusing us of violations of international law and order, of our aggressive behavior. We often hear from the West that uh, West has done it must, at its utmost to promote genuine partnership with Russia, with Moscow being reluctant to cooperate. But let me ask you, what kind of international order we are talking about? About the one where only the United States and NATO and later European Union have the right to decide what should be done in uh, security matters, be it global, be it regional. Uh, and let's be fair, Western policies also in the MENU region, those disastrous military intervention in Iraq, Libya, and now Syria resulted in power uh, and security vacuum in many areas, which were quickly filled with extremists and terrorists. Instead of bringing about reforms, those uh, interventions destroyed government institutions and the local way of life. And now we see the export of violence to our land and against our citizens. Uh, let me remind you that if you follow the Russian foreign policy for the past 15 years, you will see that all our efforts were aimed at building a collective security system which would allow for security for all, regardless of their membership in organizations or alliances. We were realistic enough to recognize the added value of cooperation with the European Union and NATO. In 1994, we signed a partnership and cooperation agreement with the European Union. Uh, we have considered relations with NATO as one of the pillars of the modern security architecture, and in 1997, we signed a cornerstone document of our relations, uh, Russia-NATO Founding Act, which lays down the basis for our partnership and commitment to military restraint, and this uh, founding uh, document, uh, the cornerstone, one of the remaining cornerstones of European security, is trembling because uh, under pressure of NATO military activity uh, with a view to protect so-called eastern, eastern flank of uh, alliance. In 1996, we joined the Council of Europe. We were proposing to place the OSCE at the center of, of European security architecture. To make a long story short, uh, we were looking at things from the point of view of uh, mutually interlocking institutions, and we were ready to cooperate with all institutions that were prepared to be engaged in us with a view of building genuine security system in Europe that will be in full in line with the new types of uh, risks and challenges, and uh, that uh, system will not be based on the assumption that there are privileged countries and non-privileged countries. Uh, whatever area you might take, the leading trend has always been to build partnership and cooperation, to capitalize on our economic, humanitarian, social, uh, historic relations, because Russia is a part of Europe, but Europe without Russia is not Europe. It could be called European Union, but, but we always were talking about uh, big Europe, big Europe, which is the home for each and every country on this continent. Uh, and uh, our uh, vision of hard security was fully in line with this vision of uh, all European house, or we remember there was a lot of ideas, like President Mitterrand was talking about European village, European uh, confederation, and we really do believe that the future of European uh, security will, be, will depend on the ability of all the states to continue to invest in uh, partnerships relations and to build uh, cooperation on the basis of equal footing without dividing lines and on the basis of basic principles of uh, security, this is indivisibility of security. Uh, however, 
uh, what we saw was the euphoric feeling of the West claiming to have won the Cold War. Uh, NATO and the EU were identified as the only uh, exclusive instruments for ensuring Euro-Atlantic security, and their vision could not be questioned. Over the years, we saw dividing lines in Europe moving eastwards. Despite our concerns, NATO continued its open-door policy, which, in our view and the view of many politicians, uh, became one of the biggest geopolitical mistakes of the 20th century. It created further dividing lines on the continent, fostering instincts of fourth-line states and artificially splitting European countries in different group of states, uh, privileged and non-privileged, in terms of security. Accession of Montenegro to NATO might become another mistake. We were unable to persuade NATO partners of the advantages of collective approach to missile defense. NATO missile program continues to take shape in Europe despite the Iranian nuclear deal. Ground-based assets will be deployed in Romania this year and in Poland in 2018. More ships with missile defense systems are being deployed to patrol seas closer to our borders. And all this is part of the global project that creates real risks for uh, Russia's uh, nuclear deterrent forces and strategic stability. Looking into the future, I see two major tasks for Russia, for Russia and NATO and the West more broadly. First of all, we have to overcome the material legacy of the Cold War. Not long ago, uh, we thought that this task belonged to the past, but with Ukrainian crisis, Cold War instincts were revived. And you can see that uh, the and you can see it by the speed uh, at which NATO made U-turn and suspended all practical cooperation with Russia, refocusing its military planning on countering so-called threats uh, coming from the, from the east. Indeed, many of my interlocutors in the alliance recognize that the events in Ukraine were used to overcome the crisis of identity in NATO, to reinvent the NATO-centric security architecture with deterrence and collective defense as its core. Military build-up has been reoriented prim primarily on the eastern flank. We see a persistent, in fact permanent, a rotation in Europe of units of the United States and their allies. Tanks, artillery systems, armored vehicles are sent to Baltic countries and other Central and European, uh, European states. U.S. Navy ships, including Aegis-equipped destroyers, have basically settled in the Black Sea. Military exercises are conducted almost every day. NATO officials claim that the measures uh, which are taken under so-called readiness action plan are calibrated and comply in full with the provisions of the 1997 Russian NATO Founding Act I referred to, uh, especially on provisions on restraint, which says very clearly that uh, NATO will refrain from any additional stationing of uh, uh, significant uh, combat forces on a permanent basis. But however, if you looked at the situation in military terms, all these actions form a new military reality, radically changing political and military landscape, particularly in the northeastern part of Europe, which used to be a very quiet and stable area. Let's be frank, a couple of years ago, uh, Baltic area was area of peace, economic cooperation, social cooperation. A number of very important institutions define uh, not only the architecture, security architecture of this region, but also the spirit of cooperation, another dimension, Baltic Council. A lot of regional, uh, regional agreements were in place. And it was a very good example that military stability and security could, could be based not on additional military measures, not on attempts to achieve military superiority, but to build common security on the basis of arms control, military restraint. Today, this uh, picture is absolutely different. And we've got uh, a new uh, area of military confrontation, and this is very bad, not only for regional security, this is bad for European security, and also uh, for security of those countries who are engaged in these military preparations. Uh, what is dangerous is that, is that all these activities, which require a permanent ideological justification in the eyes of the public, which might take us back to a spiral of confrontation and will make it extremely hard to return to a normal cooperation when it's needed.
well, it's, it's obvious that when we have this mix of uh, politics and based on, on military planning, this is something which, is, which is, uh, should be taken very seriously. And we know that from the time of confrontation, that this peril, this mix, very difficult to handle, even the situation when all necessary political conditions are in place. Coming back to tasks, apart from the overcoming the legacy of the Cold War, another major task is to act, is to act together in the areas of common interest, where necessary and possible. We saw great examples of that, successful international operation to remove chemical weapons from Syria, Iran's nuclear deal, Russia contributed to the EU mission in uh, Central African Republic and Chad, we were offering to sign an agreement with the EU on crisis management. We were prepared to establish a joint security council with the European Union, which would allow us to ensure the security of the Euro Atlantic area and to engage in the genuine partnership on equal footing. In recent years, with NATO-Russia Council, we demonstrated the ability to cooperate and to implement joint projects with a view to prevent terrorist threats in the air, to design equipment for standoff detection of explosives, to fight against piracy and other threats. We were close to reaching an agreement on the first, I should say, the first NRC operation to ensure security of the destruction of Syria chemical weapons on the United States Navy ship Capri and it should be uh, a demonstration of our ability to cooperate in the areas of common interest. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, this, this operation was regarded as a major contribution to implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution uh, 2118. In certain areas, uh, NATO-Russia Council has become an important driver of international cooperation. Uh, for example, in the area of, of uh, uh, addressing drug trafficking from Afghanistan, uh, NATO Russia Council managed to organize the biggest project uh, which uh, uh, produced very concrete results. Jointly, we trained more than 4,000 members of counter narcotics officers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asian countries. Unfortunately, all these projects have been suspended despite their obvious added value for everybody. Uh, from different corners of NATO, we hear sometimes uh, the calls to re-establish mill-to-mill contacts with Russia in order to avoid possible military incidents or misunderstandings. We understand and share these concerns, but we are not the ones to cut the lines of communications. And actually, these lines are still in place. We have in Brussels our military uh, representations, and we really do believe that systemic dialogue uh, between military is very important element of uh, new uh, security architecture in Europe, also with a view to avoid unnecessary uh, incidents, military in incidents. Uh, we don't think that uh, NRC could or should be substituted by any other body or international organizations. Uh, we don't think that uh, NRC should compete with the OSCE. We don't think that uh, NRC could replace some other uh, organizations and institutions. But we really do believe that uh, NRC could play a very important role. As it was defined in Rome Declaration, the major task of this body is to monitor jointly security horizons, to early identify problems, and to agree, if possible, on joint actions, if there is such a need. If not, then we should allow each other to act individually with full respect for legitimate interests and concerns of one another. Uh, Russia, as I said, uh, is and will be a partner of Europe, and we will continue to be active in international efforts to stabilize the situation in the Middle East, in or North Africa, and in Afghanistan in questions related to strategic stability and non-proliferation. Uh, it is an illusion to think that one can isolate us and some instruments that were switched off could, could change uh, the picture. We do not have a lack of partners today, be it in Europe or in other parts of the globe. Attempts by NATO and its allies to portray Russia as a threat coming, uh, as a threat is against their own interests. 
Such attempts cut NATO from a constructive work where cooperation with Russia is critical. First of all, in the fight against terrorism in Afghanistan and in the stabilization of the situation in MENA region. And uh, these attempts also limiting the number of areas where cooperation could bring added value. We understand the need to rebuild trust and confidence as security partners, as equal partners who have the right to defend their national interests. Our military doctrine clearly states that a fundamental condition for further dialogue with NATO is the respect by alliance for the norms of international law and refrain from attempts to strengthen its own security at the expense of security of others, which in real terms means that NATO should be become part of global security architecture and not to try to create a so-called NATO-centered globe. Global challenges that we face in the Middle East and Northern Africa leave us no other alternative to dialogue and to combine efforts by prioritizing the United, the United Nations Charter and collective actions. We have intensified bilateral contacts with the United States, France. We try to set a platform for direct talks between Syrian government and the opposition under the auspices of the United Nations. We seek to coordinate activities in the Russia, of the Russian Air Forces and those undertaken by the anti-ISIL coalition to unite efforts with the countries and the regions. And we are working on that on the basis of full respect of international law and trying to do it as a concerted action, acting together with all our partners who really share our view that the solution could be not only political, not a military one. We have no hidden agenda in the MENA region, and our primary purpose is to ensure a comprehensive approach to international fight against terrorism, which should include not only military solution, but also political one, and also uh, would, uh, should be based on efforts to cut financing and supports for terrorism, including revenues from drug trafficking, the illegal oil trade, and the arms trade. Briefly on Ukraine, the only way out of the crisis is through comprehensive and full implementation of the Minsk agreements of February 12 last year, including their political provisions, namely the adoption of a law of local elections in Donbass, an amnesty, constitutional reform that will seal the special status of uh, Donbass and Lugansk. Uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity must be secured with the understanding that the peoples of Donbass should be engaged in defining key elements of the country's political system in line with the provisions of the Minsk Agreement. We believe that uh, if we, we follow this path, uh, solution will be within our reach. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thanks for keeping to the time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when I'm in the presence not just of one but of two uh, distinguished uh, ambassadors, uh, I, as a mere politician, am just ever so slightly nervous. Uh, it has been said that ambassadors are people who can be disarming, especially when their countries are not. Uh, and that is true of probably most countries that we take an interest uh, in. It's not my purpose this afternoon simply to say that the very bad relationship between NATO and Russia is entirely the fault of Russia and that NATO is completely innocent of any responsibility. When you look back over the last 30 years, it would be unwise to make such a claim. And I think it is indeed valid to say that at certain periods in the immediate aftermath of the end of the Cold War, NATO was somewhat triumphalist in its approach to what had happened. And I've always personally believed that the uh, Kosovo War uh, was one that was pursued without proper consideration of Russia's interest and the need to get a wider support if that action was to be taken. The West did not have vital interests at stake uh, in its operation in Kosovo. And therefore, there was, in my personal view, and I've always taken this view, uh, a wider di dialogue should have been conducted at that time. But I think to understand the deterioration of relationships between Russia and NATO uh, in the recent past, you have to go back quite some way. You have to go back not just to the events in the Maidan and the downfall of Yanukovych and what followed from that. You have to go back even earlier than the enlargement of NATO to include uh, some of the new democracies of Eastern Europe, including uh, the Baltic states. You have to go back to the end of the Cold War itself. 
And we often forget that what happened in the, at that period was not one historic event, it was three separate events. It was the end, as uh, Roderick Braithwaite said, of the Cold War, a, a strategic battle between NATO and the Soviet Union, which could have resulted in a nuclear-based Third World War. That was one dramatic achievement, and we have not gone back to that, not remotely. I was at the Munich Security Conference a couple of weeks ago. I was very sad to hear President Medvedev, uh, and Prime Minister Medvedev, actually referring to us being in a new Cold War situation. That is a gross exaggeration, and I think he must know that as well as the rest of us. But what happened in 1991 was not just the end of the Cold War, nor was it the end, just also the uh, end of the battle between communism and capitalism. These were two major historic events, but there was a third event which is most relevant to what we're discussing today, and that was the collapse of Europe's last empire, the Russian Empire, when the Soviet Union imploded, disintegrated into 15 separate countries. The British Empire, the French Empire, other Western European empires had gone much earlier. This was the last European empire to implode. Somebody once said that Britain had an empire, Russia was an empire, and there's some significance in that. It is part of the inference, not the express claim, but the inference of what is said in Moscow quite often nowadays, that somehow that collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Soviet Union as a state, which uh, President Putin has uh, famously said many years ago was the, the greatest political, geopolitical disaster of his lifetime. That's the thing he most regrets about the history. There was the collapse of the Soviet Union as a state and its disintegration into 15 countries, particularly Ukraine, of course. The inference is sometimes that the West was behind that. This was some part of an American-inspired plot to weaken uh, Russia. Anyone with even a basic knowledge of the history of those days knows it was, if anything, the opposite. President George Bush, the first President Bush, made that uh, well-known visit to Kiev when the Ukrainians were contemplating declaring their independence. And he made a speech in the Ukrainian parliament trying to encourage them not to break away from the Soviet Union. So upset were Ukrainian nationalists, it became known as the, the Chicken Kiev speech uh, thereafter, which he had to live with and try and justify uh, for years, because he was afraid that the nuclear weapons in Ukraine would no longer be in the control of Moscow, and who knows who might control them. And because he was concerned that the new leadership that might emerge in Ukraine might be less liberal, more revanchist, uh, than Mr. Gorbachev represented. So far from the United States or NATO actually actively encouraging the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was differences of view. Some welcomed it. There was deep unease as to what it might imply. But I think what our Russian friends never seriously ask themselves, I think, never mind share with the rest of us, is why was the rest of the Soviet Union so desperate to get away from Russian control? Why did they see this as a historic opportunity to become independent? And why have all the countries of the former Warsaw Pact been so keen to join NATO? We didn't encourage them to join NATO. We didn't say, we insist on you doing this as a condition of our relationship with you. They clamored to join. And most of them were accepted. In the case of the Baltic states, with some uncertainty as to how wise it was. In the case of Ukraine and Georgia, I've always thought that would have been a mistake because of the lack of uh, uh, the normal criteria that NATO requires for membership. The fundamental problem for the relationship between NATO and Russia is, therefore, I would suggest too, and I don't think it's anything particularly controversial to say this, although Russians will be reluctant to acknowledge it, the fundamental reason is Russia has never been prepared to acknowledge the full, complete, and irreversible independence of those countries that were once part of the Soviet Union, and in particular Ukraine, and after Ukraine, the Baltic states, and one or two others. The very phrases, the very language used in Moscow, in Russian, the near abroad, that we have a region of special interests and various other euphemisms, which means that Russia believes, it doesn't just act, Russians believe that they have a right to forbid a country like Ukraine or the Baltic states or any other country that was part of the Soviet Union becoming institutionally involved 
particularly through NATO, but to some degree the European Union as well. And that that is something they have a right to make life difficult for them if they are tempted in that direction. So that is the dilemma we face. And it's a pity it cannot be more openly acknowledged. I think Mr. Putin is often uh, rightly described as a tactical genius. I mean, after all, he's achieved the return of Crimea to Russia. He's made himself very popular back home. He's uh, made the West look foolish in some respects in Damascus and elsewhere. He may be a tactical genius. He probably is. But strategically, has he really served Russia's fundamental interests? He has united NATO more than any Western government was able to do before the crisis in Ukraine. Nobody today in the West questions the need for NATO as a serious defensive alliance. And NATO did not want to have an excuse to forward military presence in the Baltic states or in the old Eastern Europe. That was no desire, certainly of the Western members of NATO or of the United States themselves. It is Russia's behavior in Ukraine, particularly in Crimea, that has brought that about, that has created such nervousness. And when, Ambassador, you refer to the peaceful situation that existed in the Baltic until recently, it's worth remembering that Estonia was subject to a very serious cyber attack, widely assumed, of course we can't prove it, the Soviet Union to have been responsible for when it happened, the Russia to be responsible for when it happened. So there have been, these are part of the facts of life. Now, having made these somewhat negative comments, let me say there was much in what Ambassador Grushko said that I actually agreed with. I do believe there is a crucial need for dialogue between NATO and Russia. I do believe the decision, which is speaking personally, I don't speak on behalf of a government, I do believe the decision to suspend the NATO-Russia Council was a foolish mistake. I think the whole point of the NATO-Russia Council was to have forum for dialogue when problems occur and to close it down at the very moment that these problems had become acute. And they couldn't have been more acute. The one thing you didn't mention, Ambassador, in your remarks was, of course, that Russia was responsible for the annexation of a part of the territory of another European state. The first act of that kind since 1945 and done in the most doubtful of circumstances, which I won't go into this afternoon. And in contrary, in conflict with the Budapest Memorandum, which Russia, along with other countries, had signed, in which it specifically, in exchange for Ukraine handing over its nuclear weapons, it specifically recognized the territorial integrity of Ukraine under the borders it had at that time. So this is not a question of some mistake made by Khrushchev many years ago when he transferred Crimea to Ukraine. These borders were recognized in the Budapest Memorandum after the Russian Federation had come into existence, so although before Mr. Putin came into the presidency. So these aren't my analysis of the events. These are historic facts which are well known. But I said I agreed with the ambassador that we need a closer dialogue. And I was pleased that Mr. Stoltenberg said that NATO was ready to uh, talk about resuming a dialogue with Russia, but he expressly then went on to rule out practical cooperation. I have to disagree with Mr. Stoltenberg. I hope that's not what it's limited to. I think practical cooperation is exactly what is required because practical cooperation implies in areas where there is a mutual interest, where we will benefit as well as Russia if there is effective cooperation in specific areas. And the areas are well known. Certain military to military talks, the need to avoid in a more credible way than we have at the moment, uh, incidents in the air that could lead to the Turkish type incident that happened some weeks ago. But out with the NATO specific region, of course there are common interests like the battle against terrorism, nuclear proliferation, Syria and other matters of that kind. The final point I want to make, and it's uh, something that reflects back to my earlier experience in government. Uh, when I was Minister of State at the Foreign Office in the 1980s, under Geoffrey Howe and Margaret Thatcher, I had responsibility for our bilateral relations uh, with what was then the Soviet Union. And in that capacity, I was involved in the preparation for Mr. Gorbachev's visit, the famous visit, to see Mrs. Thatcher at Chequers in the 1980s. And, of course, it's well known what flowed from that. And when Mrs. Thatcher, having met with Mr. Gorbachev at the end, said, this is a man with whom we can do business, it wasn't because they'd reached agreement in the discussions they'd had. 
they were no nearer agreement at the end of these discussions than they were at the beginning. But they had had the opportunity, both on that occasion and on subsequent occasions, to begin to understand each other, to understand where the other was coming from, to realize the motivations that were at work. And most of all, they began not only to like each other, but to trust each other. Trust doesn't mean agreement, but it makes it easier subsequently to reach agreement. And the single greatest failing we have seen in recent years is the collapse of trust. And I don't say that Russia is entirely responsible for that. I'm sure there is responsibility on both sides. But when Russia annexes territory in Europe by force, and it is by force, it, it, it happened, and when it destabilizes eastern Ukraine, you certainly helped unify the rest of Ukraine more than would have otherwise existed. But there is turmoil in Europe of a very unfortunate kind. So I simply conclude by saying, let us have the dialogue uh, that the ambassador was referring to. Let it go further than NATO is currently contemplating. And let it not just be dialogue between ambassadors or between officials, or even just between foreign ministers, because I doubt whether well, dialogue between Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Kerry will by itself take us very far. Uh, ultimately, we have to work in the not-too-distant future between the people at the very top getting to meet each other, to know each other, not because they'll reach agreement the first time or even the second time, but until that dialogue begins, then the prospect of ever reaching agreement will simply recede into the distant future. Thank you.